Let's talk through the four core rules of 10th edition Warhammer 40k, blow by blow. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Warhammer 40k 10th edition once more. And in this video we're going to go through the entire core rules of the game, the major way that Warhammer 40k is going to be played out of this new Leviathan book. In this video we're going to focus on the core rule section from the Leviathan book in full. This is the 60 page section that you'll use for most games of Warhammer 40k, though it won't include some supplemental stuff, things like the Crusade game mode, Combat Patrol, or the Warhammer 40k mission deck, which are all different ways that you can play 40k based on the core rules. This one's going to be the imprint launch edition of Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Games Workshop are going to be sending out a follow up version of this via a digital download, that might change a few things and they might make some tweaks, and there'll likely be a few FAQs to clarify some unclear things. In this review we're going to go over each rule section in brief, mainly focusing on the things that have changed, and assuming some basic knowledge of the game already, I'll also be continuing my how to play 40k series aimed at easier access videos for those new to the game, explaining the core concepts bit by bit with a few examples. I'll keep the videos in that series coming, and I'll leave a link to it down in the video description. In any case though, let's jump into it, and the contents of the core rules for Warhammer 40k are that we get some basic definitions, then we go through the turn sequence, the command phase, movement phase, shooting, charge and fight phases, then there's a quick section explaining datasheets, and there are some sections for kind of special units within datasheets, leaders, transports and aircraft have the most variant rules, and there are also a few other rules in support of that, things like the psychic keyword, auras and stuff like that. We've then got 11 universal stratagems, the rules for terrain features in Warhammer 40k, and then rules for army construction, how you score objectives, and one mission called Only War, a nice and straightforward starter mission that's aimed at newer players. Starting off we've got the basic definitions that will largely be fairly familiar to people playing 40k before, they go through the broad strokes of dice rolling, the rules are still written with the idea of dice basically being rolled one at a time, and while this can sometimes be important for getting information with regard to command points and things like that, most of the time you still find to roll fast dice basically, rolling all like weapon profiles together and making saves at the same time. That will certainly remain the way that you'll do things for most dice rolls. Otherwise there's a few other basics, you can't re-roll a re-roll, and they explain their code that they usually use for dice, so things like the d6 being a standard 6 sided dice, 2d6 being 2 of those at the same time, and d3 basically being a dice roll halved, a 1 or 2 counts as a 1, a 3 or 4 counts as a 2, and a 5 or 6 counts as a 3. Before they get into most other things, they also define the starting strength of units, as that's something that comes up in a few different rules. Starting strength is how you add the unit to your force, and if you have any attached leaders to a squad, then that counts as their starting strength from then on, though if you get either the entire squad wiped or the leader wiped out, they're then removed from consideration. So say if you had a squad that hadn't taken any casualties, but had its leader model sniped, it would still count as full starting strength for rules purposes. Below starting strength is either if you've lost one model from a multi-model unit, and below half strength is defined as single model units on less than half of their wounds, or a multi-model unit on less than half of their models, say 4 intercessors out of 10, not 5, or say 4 wounds left on a 9 wound monster perhaps, that's perhaps most relevant for Battleshock. The turn structure of Warhammer 40k 10th edition isn't so very different from 9th edition than before, games still usually have 5 battle rounds each it would seem, and each battle round is 1 turn per player, so each player also gets 5 turns total. Each player turn will progress through the phases on the right, command phase, then movement phase, shooting, charge, then fight. The main changes from 9th edition are that the morale phase has been consolidated within the command phase, it's now a second part of that after most command abilities, and the psychic phase is kind of gone and most of the mechanics with it. They now basically represent as command abilities, unit buffs, or direct psychic shooting attacks. You don't have to cast and deny anything anymore. Starting out with the command phase, in general you start with 0 CP at the start of the game, and at the start of either player's command phase, you'll both gain 1 CP to spend on stratagems later in the turn. Then for the rest of the command phase, you can use any other abilities that you have in the command phase, things like character buffs that might target a single unit for example, or choosing one or three different auras for certain powerful leaders, and these go off in an order of your choosing. Then after that you have the battle shock step, for each of your units that's below half strength, whether it's a single model or a multi-model unit, you roll 2d6 versus their leadership, often say a 6 plus or a 7 plus. If you roll lower than this number, then the unit is battle shocked and gets 3 debuffs until the start of your next command phase. It becomes objective control 0, so basically can't hold objectives at all for that time, really quite relevant as a lot of objectives are scored at the end of this command phase, so it might mean that if you get battle shocked, then you suddenly miss out on them. 
As well as that, if a unit happens to fall back in your ensuing movement phase, every model in the unit must test desperate escape. That's a high chance to lose a good chunk of models there. And also the controlling player can't use any stratagems on that unit besides insane bravery to auto-pass the test. Quite a big deal if you fail Battleshock on a unit in combat and it can't interrupt, for example, or if there's any really powerful damage or defensive stratagems they might have. It doesn't look like you need to test to regroup or anything like that. You just automatically become not Battleshocked again at the start of your next command phase, though if you're still below half strength, you might well fail it the next turn. Then we've got the movement phase. The main mechanics of movement generally work pretty similar to 9th edition, and you've still got the four options for moving that you can do. Make a normal move, advance for a bit more speed, so hold still or fall back. None of these moves can end within engagement range, 1 inch horizontally and 5 inch vertically of the enemy. Advance is still plus D6 inch move at the cost of shooting and charging normally, though assault weapons where you can get them seem pretty good in 10th. Remaining stationary is what you need to do if you stay in combat, and it can have some benefits like heavy weapons. And falling back is basically a normal move that you do to try and get out of combat. Again, that normally stops you from shooting or charging after in the turn, and you might need to test desperate escape depending on battle shock or if your models are surrounded. We'll get onto that in a second. Perhaps one of the biggest changes from the 9th edition movement phase is that you can now move through and over friendly models. Previously you could be move blocked by your own units if you move them in the wrong order. Now most of your normal units can pass straight through other friendly infantry and things if they happen to be in the way, so you're a bit less likely to move block yourself. The main exception to this is that monsters and vehicles that can't fly can't move through other monsters and vehicles, so something like a tank column still might hold itself up a bit. But you could still move friendly infantry through friendly vehicles, and friendly vehicles through friendly infantry and mounted units for example. Finally, one other change to normal movement is that you can't end a move directly on top of an objective marker. It means that they'll stay a bit more visible when you're playing games, but could be quite a big issue for things with massive bases or profiles like knights or bane blades. As units move around, they must keep in coherency, same as ninth and before. As per normal, you have to be in a continuous mass that's less than 2 inches away from other models. Coherency is 2 inch horizontally and 5 inch vertically. As before, in really quite big units with 7 models or more, your miniatures will now need to be in coherency of 2 other models. That means that they have to clump up a little bit, and the penalties for breaking that are still very punishing. You must remove models one by one at the end of the turn if they're not in coherency, until the squad is in coherency again. If two halves of the squad wind up being vastly separated, that could be quite a lot of dead models through bad positioning if you're not particularly careful. You're not allowed to voluntarily move out of coherency, so that would usually come from removing models in the wrong way when your squad takes casualties. The only major change in this from 9th edition is how many models that triggers for. Now it's 7 models or more, as opposed to 6 models or more. As people corrected me in the last video when I talked about this, this change was probably due to things like characters joining 5 model units. Though it could be kind of handy for certain units to have a max unit cap of 6, things like Space Marine Aggressors or Blade Guard or Necron Scorpec Destroyers. Otherwise, engagement range is kind of the same to 9th edition, 1 inch horizontally and 5 inch vertically. You can't normally end a move through this in the movement phase, though aircraft are an exception to that. If you start the turn within engagement range, you're normally considered locked in combat, so would either have to remain stationary or fall back as your two movement options. And engagement range might have a slightly different feel to it in 10th edition. Some of the rules for the charge and fight phase have changed a bit. Terrain rules have their own section, but the general gist is they don't tend to impede movement now. They've lost that minus 2 inches to movement penalty that you might have had through woods or across obstacles. Now one of the rules is that you can ignore any terrain feature that's less than 2 inches in height for movement, so you could have tanks rumble across low barricades and things without any problem. Most things like mounted and vehicle and monster type units can't move through ruined walls still, infantry and beasts still can. And in general, for most terrain pieces, if you want to climb up things that are greater than 2 inches in height, you do need to measure the vertical distance, so you'd measure from the model's base towards the edge of the ruin, then measure the distance they need to climb up, and then measure the distance across after that. You can't end the move halfway up a wall like that, it needs to be in somewhere that you can actually place the model. We'll talk about terrain rules a little bit later in the video. Flying models have had quite a major change going into 10th edition as well. They still retain the rule where they can move through and over friendly enemy models of any kind, so that helps avoid things like desperate breakout, and it's handy for things like flying monstrous creatures jumping over other monsters. When they're moving up and down terrain features though, you now need to measure and move the distance diagonally for the flying unit. They no longer ignore vertical move distance. It means that if you've got a fly unit moving from ground level to the top floor of a building, you'd measure that distance diagonally now. 
Probably the biggest consequence of losing that vertical move distance ignoring thing though is that they now can't just effortlessly jump over terrain. Units like jet bikes or winged monstrous creatures will now need to measure the distance around the terrain or over it, they can't go straight through as if it weren't there. Previously they'd just be able to jump over it and basically ignore the vertical distance to do so, now they can't, so it could be a bit more annoying for them to try and get round the corners into ruins and things, though it'll still be very easy for things like jump infantry that can still go through ruined walls basically. Finally for mainline movement things we've got Desperate Escape and Falling Back, previously Desperate Breakout was a stratagem and quite a pricey one at that, now in 10th edition it is basically free in terms of command points but you might pay a hefty price in terms of slain models. If say you had a unit that was entirely surrounded by enemy miniatures but still wanted to fall back, it could ignore the enemy miniatures to do so, but you have to roll 1d6 per model that's doing so, and for every 1 and 2 that you roll out of those, you have to remove a model from your squad that is slain. You get to select the model that's removed, it doesn't have to be the one that's surrounded necessarily, but it's still quite a steep price to pay. Could be an awful lot of casualties there. Titanic models and fly don't normally have to test that, and you can use it even if you're not entirely surrounded, you just want to fall back through the enemy units to say reach an objective or have a better position. The way that I think this is going to be most meaningful though I think is Battleshock. If the unit is Battleshocked and wanting to fall back, then every single model in the unit has to take this test, potentially losing a third of your squad right there, though you never have to take it multiple times for any reason, even if say you're Battleshocked and also surrounded. In general this rule will tend to be triggered by actual Battleshock tests that happen in the command phase, as most other things that hand out Battleshock will end at the end of your command phase, so won't usually trigger this rule. Finally at the end of the movement phase come reinforcements, these will still typically set up at the end of your movement phase after you've moved with everything else, and from the core rules at least there's two main ways that units can set up in reinforcements, either deep strike or strategic reserve. These two are different rules, deep strike is not strategic reserves but both are types of reinforcements, and they work a little bit differently. Deep strike is the most simple one, basically you set up your unit anywhere horizontally greater than 9 inches away of an enemy unit, that can be anywhere on the board from models teleporting down or whatever. And interestingly enough in the core rules it's got absolutely no restriction as to when you can do this on any turn, even in the example mission from this book you can still arrive from deep strike on turn 1 in a big alpha strike. There might well be something that forbids you arriving from turn 1 as with 9th edition in things like the match play type missions, that's where it was previously, though it is kind of interesting that in only war you can have deep strike arrivals straight from the first turn. Strategic reserves on the other hand have a fair few more restrictions, and these do have additional rules as to what turns you can arrive on. After a unit has been set up on the board, it counts as having made a normal move for things like heavy weapons and anything else that makes a difference from that, and can otherwise normally shoot or charge, though it would normally need quite a high roll to succeed on a charge roll. While we're on the subject of strategic reserves, these are the limitations for them. They are still their own thing within reserves, they're not the way that all reserves work these days, distinct from things like deep strike, and they no longer cost command points to put your units into them. You declare them before the game in the declare battle formation set at the same time as transports and leaders and things. For strategic reserves you can normally put up to a quarter of your army into them, incursion is 250 points, strike force 500 and onslaught is 750, and again there's no such limitation on deep strike here. When you arrive from a strategic reserve you can turn up on any battlefield edge less than 6 inches away from it. As with deep strike you can't arrive anywhere that's within 9 inches horizontally of enemy units, and that rule that allowed you to arrive super close if you set up in your own deployment zone is basically gone. As with 9th edition there are some turn limitations here, you can't come in battle round 1, on the second battle round you can set up anywhere that's outside the enemy deployment zone, there's no more enemy board edge restrictions, and then in the third and later battle rounds it can be in any battlefield edge, including your opponent's one within their own drop zone. It doesn't appear that there's anything that stops you from arriving on turn 4 or turn 5 from them now, Still looks like a very decent option to me, being command point free and just having a unit that can pretty much guarantee line of sight on something, generally seems pretty reasonable to have one or two units like that, though between the points restrictions and the way that missions work you probably don't want to go too heavy on it. Then after movement we get to the shooting phase, the sequence for this is really quite similar to how it was before, you select each unit to shoot in turn, usually not one that advanced or fell back, select your targets, fully split firing as per now. What you can shoot and kill with line of sight is fairly similar, it's basically the same as it is currently, any part of the model to any part of the enemy one, though a few things around line of sight blocking ruins have changed, which we'll get onto in the terrain section. Some character models will have the lone operative keyword, that could be things with stealth fields like assassins and things, or it could be more support units like tech marines that might get the rule if they're near to a vehicle, 
and these ones you basically can't shoot if you're greater than 12 inches away from them. It does mean that at this distance though, you wouldn't be able to hide them behind a friendly squad or anything like that, they'd suddenly become very exposed if the enemy does close the gap with them. For most units, the same as now, you can't generally target enemy units that are in engagement range, but now it does seem that monsters and vehicles that are in engagement range can be targeted, as per the big guns never tire rule that we'll get onto in just a second. Basically monsters and vehicles can shoot while they're in combat, and also be shot as well. You then get to fire all your ranged weapons on the datasheet, it's just the combat weapons where you have to just choose one normally. Taking damage in 40k again still works pretty much the same, a unit shooting attack is considered to be all happening at the same time, and if you can see one model in a squad, the rest can potentially get removed as casualties from that same shooting attack. The standard 40k damage sequence is broadly unchanged here. There are a few changes in terminology, and some of the stats have been moved around a little bit on the datasheet. You now have the ballistic skill for models listed per weapon rather than per unit. When you roll into hit, an unmodified hit roll of a 6 is counted as a critical hit. That will always count as succeeding, and sometimes might trigger other rules. One still always fail, and you still can't modify hit rolls by more than a plus 1 or minus 1. For shooting at least, stealth is one of the main ways that might often give you a hit roll modifier. Units that have stealth are minus one to hit at range, at any range whatsoever, though it's not a rule that applies in combat. Wound rolls are pretty much the same as they are now, a 2 plus to wound if you double the toughness, greater than the toughness for a 3 plus, the same as the toughness for a 4 plus, and so on. The toughness chart has been stretched a fair bit, so vehicles might be going up to toughness 14 now, so a lot of weapon profiles have also been changed for that, and otherwise they're very similar to hit rolls, Critical wounds are on a 6 plus to wound, they always pass and might trigger other rules like devastating wounds. Ones always fail, and again you can't modify them by any more than a plus 1 or minus 1, even if you have multiple stacking rules that do so. For units taking damage and saves, you have to allocate attacks to models that have taken damage first. Say if you had one model with a wound taken off it in a big unit maybe, and you can allocate them to models that are either out of range or out of line of sight provided the unit could shoot the enemy unit in the first place, and had range and line of sight to at least one model. Then finally saving throws happen as before, your normal X plus to save, and it gets modified by the AP of the gun, and invulnerables are still a thing on model datasheets, these are saves that can't ever be modified at all, so they might be the better save to take, and you have to pick one or the other. One of the only major changes to this entire sequence, is that saving throws can never be improved by more than plus one, and it sounds like this is after AP. It means that you could still potentially get a stacking plus 2 to your saves provided the enemy's gun's AP modified it back down, but it means that say a unit that was saving on a 5 plus would never be able to combine two modifiers and have it saving on a 3 plus if the enemy happened to have AP 0 when it was attacking it. A 5 plus save unit would never be able to save on better than a 4 plus unless there's something that actually changes their characteristic as opposed to a modifier to the dice roll. In the shooting and fight phase, there's a whole bunch of rules that are around taking damage. As mentioned, stealth 1 is a minus 1 to hit at range only. Various terrain rules or even unit special rules can hand out the benefit of cover. This is now plus 1 to your armor saving throw. The rules for handing it out from terrain will go over in that section, although there now seems to be one slightly weird specific restriction to this, in that you can never go from a save 3 plus to a save 2 plus when you're attacked specifically by an AP0 weapon means that your Space Marines and Sisters of Battle in cover will generally not be saving on a 2+, plus, but it's still going to be very relevant against higher AP attacks. Mortal Wounds are pretty much unchanged, the same as they were before. Mortal Wounds don't need to roll to wound the enemy, they go through any saves, no questions asked, and if you get hit by a whole bunch of them, then the damage will overflow from model to model. You don't get any lost via overkill, as you do with regular attacks. Fail No Pain can be used against mortal wounds, and this is a chance to shrug off or ignore wounds. It's listed on certain units' profiles with an X plus roll, so say your Orc Beast Snagger Boys would have their armor save, and then get the chance to ignore the wound that they'd taken with the Feel No Pain type save if they get lucky. There's no special ways to negate it, just in these core rules, like say Instant Death in previous editions, and you can only use one such Feel No Pain type rule, even if you have multiple. Finally, Deadly Demise is a unified version of Vehicle Explosions, it still happens when you roll a dice, and if you have a 6, then the vehicle explodes. Mortal wounds shower out to any units friendly and enemy within 6 inches, and you take the amount that's listed on the rule on the datasheet. Could be D6, or D3, or just 1. Going back to those monsters and vehicles in the shooting phase now, here's Big Guns Never Tire. And this one has really changed quite a bit from 9th edition into 10th, as now not only can your vehicles fire while they're in engagement range, but they can now fire out of combat, but also be shot when they're locked up. First up, if your vehicle happens to be in combat with an enemy unit, 
The enemy can still shoot at the vehicle, but they will be at a minus one to hit with everything but pistols. This means that having your own unit locked up with a vehicle isn't going to stop the enemy from laying their heavy weapons into it, though it might mean that they're a little bit less accurate. It still looks like the unit that's actually engaged with the vehicle won't be able to shoot it with their normal weapons, but they might be able to fire pistols as per the standard rules for those. Then when the vehicles and monsters get to shoot back, they can still fire at units that are within engagement range of them. Again, they get a minus one to hit with their weapons besides any pistols when they're targeting those units, and that applies to all weapons across the board now, not just heavy weapons as it was in the past. They also can't target units that are in engagement range with blast weapons still, that's on the blast weapon rules, so I guess they'd be firing those at things out of combat. Talking of which, from the rules as written, it said that vehicles and monsters in melee can fire at other units with a minus one to hit penalty when they do so. This is quite big, as it means that you can't just tie up a vehicle with a junk unit and force them to shoot all their guns into that, or fall back and waste their firepower, but again you can still cause some disruption that way. There has been a little bit of debate about that rule online, the way that it's worded. I feel like it's maybe not the most super intuitive wording from Games Workshop, but I do think that this is the way that it works currently. It's not impossible that FAQ it to work differently, but I think until then vehicles can basically both shoot and be shot in combat, usually taking a minus one to hit penalty either way. Finally for shooting rules we have a whole table of weapon abilities, Games Workshop consolidating basically all of Warhammer 40k's weapon rules into one handy table. Going down the list we've got the assault weapons, these get to advance and shoot with no penalty whatsoever now. It's a bit of a rarer keyword in 10th edition, but I think it's really quite powerful when you get it. Extra movement and full accuracy is great. Rapid fire now gives you X extra shots at half range. It's not always flat double shots at half range now, and that looks like it's apparent on Orc DACA weapons. Pistols can be fired in engagement range, usually targeting the unit that's in engagement range with them. And with pistols, you have to choose either firing your pistol weapons or, or other weapons that the unit is armed with. You can't mix and match both unless you're a monster or vehicle. Torrent weapons is basically the new flamer rule, this just auto hits with the number of shots that it gets, and a lot of them are paired with the ignores cover rule, which means that the unit can never have the benefit of cover, so usually the plus one to their saving throws. Twin linked weapons allow you to re-roll the wound roll, there's a fair few things like twin linked heavy bolters about. Lethal hits are a new one for 10th edition, where critical hits, so hit rolls of a 6, auto wound the enemy, and they don't count as a critical wound or anything when they do so. So at least there's not a slightly crazy synergy between them and devastating wounds. Still though, very nice for low strength things punching up against tough stuff. There's a lance keyword for melee weapons. If the bearer has made a charge, then you get plus one to wound with the hunting lance or orc sticker or whatever other lance you might have. There's no individual special rule for things like Drukhari dark lances or Eldar bright lances. They just have standard stats. Indirect fire is for your barrage weapons like mortars and things. That's minus one to hit, and the enemy gets the benefit of cover if it shoots at something that you can't see, though you don't have to have those penalties if you can target something that you can see. Precision is basically 10th edition's new sniper rule. If a character is visible to the unit that's attacking it, then he gets to allocate the attack to the character if you want to, potentially taking out a valuable leader from the squad if you've got enough firepower to do so. It doesn't let you do anything like snipe specials or heavies out of a unit, you can't choose which model gets removed as a casualty, and it doesn't interact with lone operative at all, so you can't snipe the units that get that keyword. It's literally just for characters leading squads. There are quite a lot of these, the new blast rules are quite powerful, you get plus one attack for every five models in the target unit. Potentially that's a very big deal, if you target blast weapons into 20 strong units, that's going to be really strong. As before, you can't use blast weapons against units that you're in engagement range with, even if you're a vehicle. The melter rule gets you X extra damage when you're within half range, often two, though it can be more on really big melter weapons. Quite nice for taking down monsters and vehicles if you can wound them. Heavy now gives you a plus one to your hit roll if you're stationary. Quite nice for big gun tanks and certain infantry portable heavy weapons that might be hitting worse unless you stay still. That's changed a bit from previously, as before it was a minus one, so it can be relevant for when it's affecting with modifiers. The hazardous rules for things like plasma guns have changed a fair bit. Now rather than every single one to hit causing you a mortal wound or slaying the model potentially, you just roll one dice after making your attacks with the weapon and hope that you don't roll a one. If you do happen to roll that one, then one weapon bearing model is destroyed, so say the plasma gunner out of a unit, and if you roll unlucky with a character monster or vehicle unit, they take three mortal wounds from it. I guess at least it no longer has issues with the number of shots, so plasma weapons are going to be fairly universally dangerous, as opposed to just the ones with loads of shots being far worse. Might be a bit risky for a character choosing to overheat a plasma pistol though, you're risking a lot of damage to your own character there, maybe for marginal gains. 
Devastating wounds means that critical wounds, usually of a 6, will deal mortal wounds. These mortal wounds basically take the weapon damage characteristic, turn them into mortal wounds, and the attack sequence ends there. You don't get them in addition to your regular damage. Effectively, it means that they kind of ignore saving throws if you get that wound roll of a 6, including invulnerable saves. The anti-roll is often paired with devastating wounds as well. This is for things that target certain classes. It's usually listed as wound rolls of an X plus against one type of target will auto wound and get a critical wound when they do so. So far we've seen this on things like chain fists, auto wounding vehicles on a 3 plus, poison weapons for Drukhari, auto wounding infantry on a 3, or say an Admech arc rifle, auto wounding on a 4 plus and combining that with devastating wounds so any of those 4 pluses translate to mortals. For melee weapons, extra attacks means that you can fight with this weapon in addition to the primary weapon that you've chosen, so you get a bunch of bonus attacks from this, like say some cavalry attacks. And then finally, sustained hits is kind of a flat extra damage boost to your weapon. You get X extra hits on a critical hit, usually a 6. Might just be one extra hit for every 6, so usually just adds a few more hits to your unit's firepower. Overall, quite a lot of solid abilities there. Pretty much all of them seem at least fairly meaningful. I do quite like the changes to things like hazardous weapons, and the assault keyword does seem particularly nice for the few units that get it these days. After you've shot your guns with all of their fancy rules, you get onto the charge phase. Again, a few minor tweaks compared with the 9th edition version here. To charge a unit, you select a unit within 12 inches. You can't charge if you're advanced, fallen back, or if you're in combat currently, and you can't normally charge aircraft unless you have fly. You then roll your charge distance, which is 2d6 inches. Then the rules for charging have changed slightly since 9th edition. As before, you need to get within engagement range to make a successful charge. Usually that's 1 inches, so it means that you'll still make a successful charge out of deep strike on a 9 inches. But the restriction here is that if you can get into base contact, then you must do so, rather than just doing some gamey thing like holding out to 1 inches before, and then using pilot and consolidate for extra movement means that we should have a lot more dense combats where a lot of units must pile into the enemy as fully as possible, and even if they can't, all models must finish the move closer to the unit that they charged compared with normal, and again that might limit things slightly like chaining out to objectives, which was kind of easy to do for bigger units. The controlling player selects the order in which they move models for this, and the unit must also retain coherency and stay out of engagement range of things that they didn't charge. Otherwise for basic charge phase rules, terrain and fly units are basically treated the same as the movement phase, Ignore terrain features less than 2 inches in heights, others must be measured for the units to climb up them, and fly units can cross friendly and enemy models and move up and down terrain, but must measure diagonally. Then, after you've made any of your charges, your charging units will get to have the fight's first rule and the following fight phase, typically meaning that they'll fight before any enemy units, unless they have other rules like that of their own. Then when we actually get to doing the damage in combat, units that can be selected to fight are ones that are either in engagement range or have made a charge move earlier that turn. You can still select a unit to charge if it's out of engagement range when it gets to its turn. Sometimes it can be relevant due to piling and consolidation. Compared with 9th edition, the 10th edition rules are a little bit more straightforward. There's only really two main phases now, fights first and fights normally. Fights last is pretty much gone from the rules. Basically units with the fight first rule will get to attack first, and charging units all get this, and then all other units follow this. The alternating system has changed a little bit though, say if your opponent and you both have units that fight first, then you actually get to start with a player whose turn is not taking place, so the player who isn't charging. It means that say if you charge a unit into an enemy unit that has fights first, usually your opponent is going to have the option of activating with that unit before your charging unit, which could be quite a bad thing if they're scary in melee. They need to alternate from unit to unit, fully complete the fight's first step, and then progress to the all other units and continue alternating there. Then each time that you fight with units, pile-in is still 3 inches towards the closest enemy model. You've got to end in base contact now if possible, which is a change compared with before. Again another little rule that makes your fight phase movement quite a lot more restrictive. And same as before, you can't pile-in or consolidate if you're already in base to base contact. Then, for activating your models to fight, you can either fight with a model if they're within base contact of the enemy, or within engagement range, or if your unit's super tight and packs, then you have the option to fight in two ranks. Basically, you get to attack with one of your own models, provided it's in base contact with one of your models, that's in base contact itself with the enemy. In this example on the right, it means that four of those five space marines will be able to fight here, two because they're within base contact with those blue shaded tyranids, and then two because they're within base contact of them. Then when you make attacks with your units, each model chooses just one of its melee weapons on its profile to attack with, plus any with the extra attacks rule, which of course it gets extra attacks with. 
The process for doing damage is basically the same as shooting. All the unit's attacks are treated as happening simultaneously, rolling one weapon profile at a time. It means that your opponent can't craftily remove casualties to, say, keep a power fist or something out of combat just because you haven't rolled with it yet. Then, after you've fought and your opponent's removed casualties, consolidate is again a lot more restrictive now than it was before. It's not just three inches vaguely towards the next enemy model. Consolidation moves are still three inches and usually must end closer to the closest enemy model, but basically you can now only do it if you're either already in engagement range or if the consolidation move would either bring you into an engagement range or on an objective. If you do happen to be consolidating when your unit's still within engagement range, then any models must be moved into base contact with a consolidate move if they can. And then say if you're making a consolidate move because you've wiped out your opponent or you're activating to fight as you've previously made a charge move this turn, any consolidate move could be used to either take you into an engagement range with another enemy unit, again into base contact if possible, and if both of the above aren't possible, you are allowed to move 3 inches towards the nearest objective marker, provided it actually puts your unit in range of it to score it. That is quite handy, as often one of the main things that you want to do with your units after fighting is to jump on an objective for the next turn. Overall, the general feel of the charge and fight phase is a lot more tightly packed combats, I think. Way more restrictions as to all the moves that you can make, and there's going to be a lot less wiggling around enemy units to gain a crafty 6 inch movement or so. Overall, it might make certain melee shenanigans a little bit more hard to pull off, though to be honest, I feel like most of these feel kind of fluffy. It was a bit weird seeing units doing gamey maneuvers in the charge and fight phase to reach objectives and things, rather than actually, say, charging and fighting the opponents. Overall, that's the basic turn structure of Warhammer 40k 10th edition, but there are plenty of other supporting rules that you actually need to play a game, understanding data sheets, certain units like leaders, transports, and aircraft that work differently terrain features, stratagems, army construction, and missions. Starting off, we'll look at data sheets. These ones are generally going to be accessed from data cards from these index decks that Games Workshop are coming out with. They appear to have two different sides to them, one like this for army construction, and then the other side for using in-game where they've got the weapon profiles and things. This army construction side shows how many models that you can have in a squad, what weapons you can choose to arm them with, and a few other important army construction things for special units like leaders and what units they can lead, and transports and what units they can hold. You don't get points costs on this side, that's going to be available either in the codexes or the Munitorum field manual. The unit's keywords are on both sides, here you get a faction keyword on the bottom right, that's the major one for showing which units can be used by which army, like these Chaos Space Marines to Heretic Astartes, and it looks like at least a few armies have sub-faction keywords, it does seem like Space Marines might be a major user of that, like Rebute Gilliman hailing from the Ultramarines. Otherwise, the main set of keywords has a bunch of other useful stuff, things like the infantry keyword for interacting with ruins, battle line for how many times you can take the unit in your army, and certain other ones that might be applicable for using character buffs or certain stratagems like the grenades one here. There's a lot of rules that key off unit keywords. Then on the other side, we've got the actual in-game side for your data card. The unit stat line is at the top, Going from left to right, we've got the movement characteristic and how far it can make a normal move, the toughness for the wound chart and how easy it is to wound the model, a saving throw that could get buffed by cover or worsened by AP, the amount of wounds or lives that the model has, the leadership for its chance to fail battle shock if you roll below it, and a stat called its objective control, where if you have the more points of this, then you hold the objective. Then below that, you've got the weapon profiles divided into ranged and melee weapons, Compared with 9th edition, the attacks and ballistic skill and weapon skill profiles have all been moved down to here, as they might vary weapon on weapon, which I think is a fairly nice touch. For the weapon stats, you've got the range of the weapon, how far it can affect, how many attacks it has, the number that it needs to hit on, the strength for the strength versus toughness wound chart, the armor penetration and how much it modifies the opponent's save, and then the damage characteristic for how much damage it does. Then, on the right hand side of the data sheet, you've got the abilities section, Core abilities for ones that are within the core book, like Deep Strike on these Terminators, and things like Infiltrate or Scouts. Faction ones that are specific to a given army, say Oath of Moment for the Space Marines, or Synapse for the Tyranids. These are the ones that are independent of detachments and things. Then a bunch of special rules that are relevant to the unit itself. Just about every unit in 40k has a somewhat unique one now. The Terminators have one for their Teleport Homer, and one for extra damage in Oath of Moment. And below these abilities, you'll have the model's invulnerable save if it has one, a 4 plus for these terminators, and also any degrading rules for bigger things like monsters and vehicles. Often they'll get a minus 1 to hit at a third or less wounds remaining, 
It might also affect the objective control stat for certain Titanic models. Overall, I feel like these data cards are quite a swish revision of the 9th edition ones, pretty intuitive and uncluttered, a nice little picture of the unit, and a nice visual display of the relevant information. While we're on data sheets though, there's another three different types of units that work a bit differently to normal ones that we've discussed so far, and those are characters, transports, and aircraft. Characters that aren't great big enormous things that you can target directly are split into either leaders or lone operatives. Leaders are maybe the slightly more common type, and their rules are to attach to a unit pre-game. It's specified which options they have on their datasheet, and from the ones that we've seen they generally tend to share a similar armour class or very similar models to the leader themselves. Say for example a Primaris Lieutenant in standard Indomitus armour, leading various Space Marine units that have the same model armour class. You declare when the leader is attached to the units as part of the declare battle formation step, and from then on the unit is designated their bodyguard, counting as one single unit from then on forward. Typically, you only allowed one leader per unit, but a few codexes will allow multiple for certain classes, particularly ones with minor support characters. If the enemy attacks the units, then you have to tank the wounds on the bodyguards first, you use the toughness of the bodyguards for rolling when you attack the units, but then basically when the bodyguard is depleted, the character will be out on its own. You don't have the option to join other squads as you might have had in previous editions. Normally speaking, you can't generally allocate attacks to the character by choice. The enemy can do that by the precision keyword, and even if the character happens to have taken some damage with precision and snipers, it will still be allocating the attacks to the bodyguard units first, unless the enemy has more precision to throw at them. Overall, characters generally tend to function as powerful unit upgrades now. Canty has one unit while they are live for all rules purposes. The unit would gain the character keyword. And then, as we mentioned earlier, for half-strength and below-strength units, once either the full character or the full bodyguard is removed, you then take things afresh again. If, say, a Space Marine captain was on his own and uninjured after he's had his entire squad shot down, the captain still counts as full strength once more. The other type of character are lone operatives. We did mention them briefly in the shooting section. The rules are really quite simple. If the character has this rule, then they won't generally be part of a unit, and they can't be shot from greater than 12 inches away. If the enemy gets close, then you will be able to shoot them, even if they're behind screening units, and that is a change from 9th edition 40k. In some ways, it's a more powerful rule at stopping them from getting shot across the board, in some ways a bit less so, as they can't hide behind units if the enemy gets close. Some units just get lone operative permanently. I believe the assassins will get this. A bunch of units, though, like Gilliman and Tech Marines and things, will have positioning requirements. Say, for example, Gilliman needs to be near any Astartes infantry unit to gain it, and Belisarius Call needs to be near any Admech unit to gain it. Next up, we've got transports, Uranos, Wave Serpents, and Raiders and things. As mentioned, these have got their transport capacity on the datasheet. That's listed on the army construction side of it, and any restrictions like, say, not being able to transport terminators and things. For actual dedicated transports, units that have that keyword, and aren't just big vehicles that can happen to take other enemy units, they absolutely have to have a unit start inside them, and if they don't, then the unit gets destroyed, so the punishment for breaking that rule is again very harsh. That's basically to stop you just spamming loads of dedicated transports, and not using them for their intended role, I suppose. Scouts rules, as we'll get onto in just a second, will confer this pre-game movability to a dedicated transport, so that's quite powerful for any infantry units that can take a transport and have the rule. For embarking, things are basically the same as they were in 9th edition. You can embark into a transport if every model ends a normal advance or fallback move within 3 inches of the vehicle, and then the transport can then move without restriction and do what it wants to do later in the movement phase. For disembarking though, it's a fairly major change compared with 9th edition. You can still get out wholly within 3 inches, and if the transport hasn't moved, your unit can then go on to act normally, move itself and go on to charge if you want to. But now in 10th edition, you can also get out of the transport after the transport has made a normal move, not an advance or a fallback. So basically your transport could zoom up the board and drop your units onto an objective or next to an enemy unit that they want to shoot, and then light them up with their guns. If you choose to do it that way, then the unit that's just got out of the transport can't move themselves this turn, and they also can't make a charge either, not unless you've got a fancy special rule like the Lamb Raider has. Still though, for most transports, that really is quite powerful. Zip units onto objectives and jump them out to score the points, and get any short-range guns on target. Finally, there's a few other special rules regarding transport. There's a new firing deck rule, which means that X-embarked models can fire one ranged weapon each out of the top of the transport, even if they're armed with more than one. Those weapons count as being mounted on the transport for the rules purposes for this. I guess that would mean that it gets any buffs that the transport has got, so I guess that could be useful. It seems that firing deck capacity is a little bit more generous in 10th edition, with things like rhinos and goliath trucks allowing you to fire out of them when you couldn't before. 
Finally, for destroyed transports, the rules have actually got a bit more lenient on these. You roll a dice for each model within, and on a 1 it suffers a mortal wound. Previously, for each 1 that you rolled, you had to lose an entire slain model, so this is going to be far less punishing for multi-wound infantry, or units with feel no pain type saves. Still fairly nasty for 1 wound infantry without the... If a transport's destroyed, then you get to be battle shocked until the start of your next command phase, and the unit can't charge in that same turn. That'd be a little bit on the rare side though, that'd be your opponent destroying the transport in your own turn somehow, maybe with an explosion or overwatch or something. Emergency disembarkation has gone from a stratagem to just a generic disembarking transport rule, which I think is quite good. This allows you to get out anywhere within 6 inch range of the destroyed transport if you can't deploy normally. This one offers the mortal wound chance that you get from a 1 to 3, so you are a lot more likely to take damage, but I guess it's better than having models wiped out straight out. If even with this restriction there's no way that you can deploy the models due to there being too many enemy models around, any further models are destroyed. I think you would need to be in quite a big horde for that to be the case, but with engagement range it's not impossible. Finally, for the three slightly oddball classes, we have Aircraft. Flyers in Warhammer 40k 10th still needs to start in Strategic Reserve, similar to Arcs of Omen. And with Strategic Reserve, that means they'll come on at the board edge and round two earliest. A bit of a restriction there, and a bit less prone to Alpha Strikes. Movement-wise, Flyers have also received another fairly big restriction. They must now always normal move, they can't advance or anything. But they do get to do so even if they're within engagement range, they basically ignore other units for that purposes. The big change for 10th edition is they have to make that normal move at least 20 inches straight forward, and then potentially up to their maximum move if they want to go further. In 9th edition you were able to pivot before you made that move, now you must just make this move straight forward, and then you get to pivot at the end of that move, basically to line up where your flyer wants to go next turn. If due to these rules the flyer is forced to fly off the board once more, then it goes back into strategic reserve. I guess potentially if your opponent has an enormous amount of board control, your opponent might even be able to line up units to force that to happen. Just put a whole load of units on the flyer's flight path so there's nowhere that it can land. As the flyers are swooping around the board, they're kind of ignored by ground units, they can move over and through the flyers as with now. They can end a move within engagement range of them and they basically just ignore them. The only thing they can't do is actually end the move over a flyer's base, so there still is the possibility for flyers to move block at least a little bit. Otherwise, combat-wise, for the most part you can't charge flyers, and they can't charge themselves. Aircraft can only be charged by fly units, and they can only attack these, and they can't pile in or consolidate when they fight. If you have some groundbound troops nearby and they're fighting, then aircraft can be ignored for pile in and consolidate purposes, so they're not dragging enemy units out of combat towards them. Finally, one other major change for aircraft is the hover rule, which again technically seems to be a bit of a downgrade for the class once more. In 10th edition it looks like you can no longer choose to either swap between hover mode and fly mode for the flyers that have the hover keyword. Currently the gunship type flyers like the Storm Raven that have that, they can either choose to go into hover mode and move up to 20 inches, then on another turn they could take to the sky again and zoom off the board or fly a very long way. Now though, you choose either hover mode or fly mode at the start of the game during the declare battle formation step. If you go for hover mode, then they basically lose aircraft and count as more normal units. That means that you can deploy them on the board. Their movement characteristic becomes 20 for the rest of the game, and it loses all of these previous restrictions associated with aircraft, basically just counting as a normal vehicle. I guess it could be pretty handy to have the option of starting on the board for units with the hover word. It does seem like a bit of a loss of flexibility though. Overall, the core rules definitely seem a bit restrictive for flyers. There's still nothing to say that aircraft can't be pretty strong though, depending on the points that they get given. It doesn't look like there's any restrictions to taking multiple of them in the army construction rules now, so if they get very good, you could go back to a world in which that you could spam them a lot. Finally, for universal datasheet things and special rules that appear on quite a lot of 40k models, there's a couple of deployment type rules and a couple of abilities that are common to certain effects. For the deployment type things, there's scouts and infiltrators. The scouts rule is the new version of pre-game moves, consolidated into one rule rather than being listed on every single datasheet differently. The scouts rule allows you to move x inches at the start of the first battle round, and you must end the move greater than 9 inches away from enemy models. Previously you'd alternate these, but now it looks like the player with the first turn gets to move all of their scout models first, really quite a big advantage to seizing the midboard I think. Units with a scout rule confer the rule to any dedicated transport that they might be in, so that could be quite nice for things like Sisters of Battle Dominions in Rhinos, I suppose. Otherwise, Infiltrators are your four deployment units. These can set up anywhere on the board greater than 9 inches away from enemy models and the enemy deployment zone, often used to take up positions on midfield objectives, or potentially get in a good position to alpha strike the enemy. 
Unlike scouts, it looks like these are set up after the main amount of models in your army have been deployed. You now roll off to see who gets to deploy these first. Sometimes that can be kind of important, as the person who gets the first drop with these could take up the best position and screen out enemy infiltrators from grabbing that point. Otherwise, just for a last couple of miscellaneous datasheet things, it still seems that plenty of abilities in 40k 10th edition function as auras, basically rules that might apply to other models in your army or maybe enemy units that are within a certain range of your model. They do seem to be a fair bit less common in 10th edition compared with 9th, but quite a lot of big characters have them and certain army rules. Basically speaking, they haven't really changed too much. Multiples of the same aura don't stack, so you can't be repeatedly debuffing things with the Death Guard's minus one toughness, for example. Models still count as always within range of their own aura ability. That's not really a change, and it's still good news for characters with powerful auras that might buff melee, for example. Perhaps the biggest change going into 10th edition is that the core keyword is no longer a thing, so that means a lot of units that do have auras might well affect big scary things like super heavies or vehicles, previously ones that might have been locked out of certain damage boosts. The aura abilities themselves might still have further restrictions on though, say for example they might affect one faction's infantry, so it might be locked out of vehicles still. Finally for datasheet things, a fair few abilities have the psychic keyword. This one was kind of intriguing to see as it applied to quite a lot of attacks and also unit abilities. It doesn't actually give you any extra rules just on its own right though. You don't have to roll to test psychic or anything whenever you use one of those abilities. But also nor does your opponent have a way of interfering them, at least with normal enemy psychers. They can't be denying the witch on you now. It looks like for this keyword, the main purpose of it is psychic defense. If say your psychic shooting attack has the psychic keyword, Certain units get a feel no pain type save against those attacks, say for example the Sisters of Silence basically get to ignore damage on a 3 plus, really quite big. There may also be units out there that turn off psychic abilities within a certain close range. At time of recording I haven't seen the data sheets for the Calexus Assassin here, but I'd be kind of surprised if that one didn't mess with your psychic abilities on your units. Some units also have the psychic keyword as well, again this might be something that is particularly useful for anti-psychic units, basically getting damage boosts against people who use warp magic. Moving onwards we've got stratagems and the 11 core stratagems of Warhammer 40k. Stratagems work in a similar way, we talked about gaining command points in the command phase. Beyond that command phase command point, you can still generally gain no more than one from any other source, they're capped at one command point per battle round. And as with previously, you can still use stratagems no more than once per phase, so you can't double up on them normally unless there's a specific datasheet rule that allows you to do so. In general, you get 6 stratagems depending on which detachment you've picked, and then those 6 stratagems are added to the 11 standard options, giving you 17 stratagem choices in most games unless there's more for the mission. Going through the core stratagem list, first up we have grenades, 1 command point to throw some mortal wounds at an 8 inch range. This one's usually infantry units with the grenade keyword, and the way it works is you roll 66 for one enemy unit, one mortal wound on a 4 plus for each. Usually hands out around about 3 mortal wounds. Could be pretty handy if you've got an infantry unit that really needs to finish off a hard target, this could give them a surprise damage boost. Tank shock is one command point, and you activate it when you have a vehicle charging. Currently no stipulation about it not being walkers, unless Games Workshop issues an FAQ. You then select one melee weapon that the vehicle has, roll 1d6 per pip of strength on the melee weapon, so say 6 dice for a strength 6 rhino, or 8 dice for a strength 8 bane blade, and then you add another 2 dice to that if it's greater than the enemy's toughness. You roll all of those dice, and then on a 5 plus you get a mortal wound for each one of those to a maximum of 6. For most standard sized vehicles charging, that could easily be 3 or 4 mortal wounds on an enemy infantry unit, really quite nice to road kill them if they're claiming an objective or something, seems pretty nice situationally. For one command point we've got insane bravery, which happens when you just failed a battle shock test, the unit counts as having passed it instead, and I feel like this one is absolutely going to get used in the command phase, as sometimes it's going to be the difference between a unit being able to hold an objective and not being able to take it, directly trading command points for victory points, and one of the best ways that you can spend CP towards winning the game. Could be pretty big if you desperately need to spend another stratagem on the unit later in the turn as well, or need to fall back with them through desperate escape. Next up for one command point there's epic challenge, this one you have one of your characters in combat with an enemy unit that's got an attached leader, and when your character fights, their attacks gain the precision keyword, so basically he gets to try and snipe out and kill the enemy leader first. Seems pretty good if you don't think that you're actually going to wipe out the enemy's bodyguards, and you desperately need to try and kill the leader before they strike back hard, or you just want to try and assassinate an important buffing character out of the squad. For 2CP there's counter offensive, this is the fairly standard interrupting in the fight phase now. After the enemy unit has fought, your unit gets to fight next, Really quite a big deal if it makes the difference between fighting first or second. 
and the trusty command point reroll is still here. You get to reroll a hit, wound, desperate escape, hazardous, advance, charge, damage, saving throw, or random attacks roll. More or less the same, and often quite a big deal if you fail a key save or fail a key charge. New for 10th edition are re-rolling a desperate escape or the hazardous check. That could potentially save you some mortal wounds on a character or something. And notably, you can't re-roll battle shock. That's going to be insane bravery if you need to negate that. In the right circumstances and flipping a big result around, it can still be one of the most powerful stratagems that you can use. For the last five, next up we've got rapid ingress. This one allows your reinforcements to arrive in the enemy turn, potentially jumping on an objective and helping secure it, or maybe hiding behind a line of sight blocking terrain or something, and potentially setting themselves up for a very easy charge when it gets to your turn. Definitely a very crafty option with certain deep strikers. For one command point, there's fire overwatch, which has changed quite a lot. It still triggers a shooting attack where you need sixes to hit, so it's quite good with any auto-hitting torrent weapons, but now you can target it a lot more flexibly, targeting any enemy unit within 24 inches. Rather than just when the opponent charges you, you can now trigger it at basically five different stages. You can trigger it in the enemy movement phase at the start or end of an enemy move. When an enemy unit arrives from reinforcements as a kind of mini auspect scan type thing, and also at either the start or end of an enemy charge phase as well. A bit more of a traditional use there, but at the end of the charge phase could be interesting. It means that, say, you could fire pistols after the opponent charged you from behind terrain. For certain big scary shooting units, particularly targeting things that are kind of light and fragile, this is a really big deal. Next up, we've got a couple of defensive ones. Go to ground is infantry only, and it gives them a 6 plus inbore save, plus the benefit of cover against ranged. Maybe not the single most high yield one this one, but that's going to be quite big on a high save unit, particularly one that you absolutely need to keep alive on an objective maybe. For a little bit more value for the durability, I think smoke screen does a bit better for that. You trigger this on a vehicle with a smoke keyword, and it gives them stealth against shooting for a minus one to hit. That's quite a nice debuff just by itself, but it also gets the benefit of cover as well, so usually a plus one to its saves. Between those two, you'd be reducing damage by a significant amount there. Pretty solid on top of the improved toughness profiles that vehicles have in 10th. Finally, Heroic Intervention has seen some major changes. Two command points for a bit of a counter charge type thing similar to before. Now you need to pay CP for it, but it's no longer locked to characters and it has a slightly bigger threat range. You trigger this after an enemy unit has finished a charge move that finishes within 6 inches of your unit. You spend your command points and then you get to attempt to counter charge the enemy. 2d6 inches, again you could fail that. It could mean that your opponent might have to deal with a very scary melee unit as opposed to what they actually wanted to charge. In general though, they will typically get to strike before you. Making a heroic intervention charge like this doesn't actually give you the fight's first rule, so you wouldn't want to do it if the opponent's unit is massively deadly and could kill your heroic intervening unit before you got to fight with it. You generally want to do it if it's something big and tough and can just muscle over the enemy. There is just the one restriction that you can't do it with non-walker vehicles, so you can't do it with things like transports or tanks just to be a bit of a nuisance. Overall, I feel like the core stratagems are all generally quite powerful. I don't think any of them are useless or redundant. Maybe Epic Challenge is a little bit more niche than most, and Go to Ground perhaps doesn't give you as big a return on investment as some, but given the right circumstances, I think literally all of them are useful. Rapid Ingress looks incredibly scary when used on the right unit to get a short charge. Fire Overwatch could add just a fair bit of raw extra damage with a massive unit targeting a fragile unit that just exposed itself, and Heroic Intervention allowing big units to protect smaller ones is pretty massive. Next up we've got the rules for the battlefield itself with terrain features in 10th edition. Again this one's a section that's really been simplified quite a lot. Dense cover for a minus one to hit is gone. Movement restrictions with a minus two inches to your movement in things like craters are also gone. For the most part it's things like a plus one to your cover save, and big ruins still block line of sight to a bunch of things. As mentioned in the shooting phase, getting the benefit of cover gets you a plus one to your armor save, though it doesn't improve three plus saves against AP zero attacks, so it can't have space ruins going up to be a two plus armor save. For movement restrictions, going over most terrain pieces, you measure the movement vertically when you get your base to that terrain piece. That'd be what you need to do for climbing things like walls and hills. Though terrain features that are less than 2 inches in height can basically be ignored, but you can't finish on top of them. The terrain features are really quite straightforward. Rubble and craters will give infantry cover, no movement debuff, and it won't give you cover to bigger things or beasts apparently. Things like barricades and fuel pipes often won't trouble you with movement, seeing as they're often less than 2 inches in height. They grant the benefit of cover to infantry models that are wholly within 3 inches of the terrain feature, and at least partially obscured by it to at least one enemy model. And they also have some special rules for fighting across with melee. 
You can count as having made a successful charge if you get to within 2 inches of the enemy unit if you're fighting across the terrain feature, and you can also attack them as well within 2 inches of the same distance, though it doesn't technically count as engagement range, so you might still be able to shoot the next turn as well. Battlefield Debris grants cover to models that are partially obscured by it. This is really quite easy to access for things like big vehicles and monsters. If they're even partially obscured to one model in the shooting unit, then they get the extra plus one to their cover save. Quite nice for them there. And then hills basically don't have any special rules for movement and things. If they're big blocky things with sharp faces, you might need to use the vertical movement distance, but otherwise function basically the same as battlefield debris. They'll also gain the benefit of cover to models that are partially obscured by them. So say if you had a vehicle that was behind the hill and you couldn't see all of it. Then we've got the two more complex bits of terrain, woods and ruins. Woods will grant cover to any units wholly within them, and also to any units that are behind the shadow of the woods essentially. If the enemy unit has to draw line of sight anywhere through or over the woods, those models will count as partially obscured and gain the benefit of cover. They'll do that even if you could basically see all of them anyway just through a gap in the trees. This doesn't apply for towering units or aircraft, they'll never gain the benefit of cover that way. Finally, ruins are perhaps one of the most important terrain pieces in Warhammer 40k. Again, they work kind of similar to battlefield debris and woods. They'll grant the benefit of cover to units that are either wholly within them or partially obscured to any extent, so can help out a fair bit there. But they can also block line of sights to enemies trying to trace their line of sight directly through a big ruin. As with 9th edition, this isn't changed too much for the main mechanics of it. If the unit is within the ruin, then provided the enemy can actually see them, the ruin won't block line of sight to them. But if your opponent's unit was on the far side of the ruin, even if you could trace a physical line of sight, the ruin would block line of sight to them. The biggest change with that particular rule is that towering units and aircraft, they ignore that rule on both sides now. Your units will still be able to shoot them even if they are directly behind a ruin, provided you could actually gain a physical line of sight to them of course. But now that also works vice versa as well. They get to ignore the obscuring type benefit that ruins get now. And again, provided they can get a physical line of sight, they can shoot to things that are on the far side of the ruin because they're so tall or high up. Quite a big deal, and it's going to be a lot harder to hide things against night armies, for example. Finally, there's two other special rules that relate to ruins. First up, if you're greater than 6 inches across the ground and you're shooting at a target on ground level, you get a rule called Plunging Fire. That gives you one pip of extra AP against units that you target as such. So if you put some Devastators or Snipers or something very high up in a ruin, then that could give them a little bit of extra AP. Finally, for the rules for moving through ruins, infantry and beasts can move through ruin walls, kind of similar to Breachable in 9th edition, and then infantry, beast and fly models, they can all move to the upper floors of ruins. They must be set up somewhere where their base doesn't overhang though, so that could mean that there's a little bit more restriction there. As mentioned before, fly units don't get to completely ignore terrain now, so their interaction with ruins is just a little bit harder than it was before. They have to go around any physical walls that get in their way. Overall, I'd say it broadly seems quite good. I think we'll have a fair few more units that are getting the benefit of cover by being partially obscured by something. Things like being partially in the shadow of ruins to one model in the firing squad. And battlefield debris looks like it would give out cover saves like crazy. I guess it makes sense that if you can see towering units over cover, then they can see you. But again, that is going to be a big shake-up. Certain boards are going to be very hard to hide from knights on if you've got a bunch of porous ruins with a bunch of windows modelled in them. I feel like that change is going to be a bit weird, not being able to hide your own units. Moving on for actually getting into a game of Warhammer 40k, we've got the army construction rules next. One of the main changes for these is that power level is basically dead. Everything is done by points now, and the points will either be found in your codexes or the Munitorum field manual. There's three main levels of play of mainstream 40k, Incursion at 1000 points, Strike Force at 2000, and Onslaught at 3000. There will be other game modes like Narrative Crusade things and Combat Patrol. To make an army list, you record a list on your army roster, either on paper, on their upcoming revamped 40k app, or on Battlescribe I suppose. And then before you pick units, you've got to pick a faction, so a faction keyword on the bottom right of the card, things like Adeptus Astartes or Eldari for example. And then you pick one of the detachments for your faction, and that's the one that you build your army around. They give you your main army rules, and some of them might have restrictions for certain models that you can or can't take. Then you select your units, and things are a lot more simplified compared with 9th edition. No messing around with formations or battlefield roles anymore, Games Workshop have made things ridiculously simple. You must have at least one character model so you can have a warlord, but then besides that it's basically 0 to 3 of just about any data sheets in the game. The only exception are epic heroes which you can only have one of each, named characters like Robute Gilliman for example. You can have 0 to 6 of any battle line units or dedicated transports, so a bit more for the common choices of your army, 
though dedicated transports do have the further restriction that if you don't start something in them, then they blow up on the first battle rounds. It does seem remarkably freeform, you could just have one character and the entire rest of your army in battle tanks, or just light infantry maybe. Fairly easy just to take your favourite data sheets out of the entire faction. Then you've got the option for enhancements, which are basically replaced relics and warlord traits. You'll have access to four of these on each detachment. There's no generic ones here in the book, so those are the only ones that you get the choice of. These can be given to characters that aren't epic heroes. Epic heroes are banned from taking them, and you can only have one for each of the characters. You can't double up with one character taking two enhancements. Three of your characters can each take a different enhancement. You don't have to pay command points or anything like that, so I guess that's a small extra incentive to take somewhere between one and three non-named characters, as they give you the extra advantage of hoovering up the good enhancements that your army might have to offer. Finally, when you've picked your units and enhanced your characters, you then select a warlord. They don't get any extra special rules, but they're just the nominal leader of your army. They might be relevant for certain mission objectives. Then when you've mustered your army, you can set up for a game. Games Workshop give a couple of examples of example battlefields with a fairly reasonable set of terrain to play on. This set seems very similar to how much you might be expected to use in 9th edition. Plenty of nice big line of sight blocking ruins to make sure that neither one player nor their opponent just gets to shoot the other army off the board turn 1 if they go first. It's important to be able to hide units. They have a bit of guidance saying that you probably don't want to be using too much more terrain than this or too much less, otherwise you're going to start to give really big advantages to range or melee armies. Generally speaking, some good line of sight blocking terrain in the middle and in the deployment zones seems like a good idea. Finally, for universal rules before getting into a mission, we've also got some rules for objective markers as well, and how these are scored in Warhammer 40k. It still seems that objective markers are generally meant to be a 40mm base, and then the distance to score the objective marker is less than 3 inch horizontally or 5 inch vertically of that marker. In 10th edition, rather than having objectives secured and that basically trumping other units that don't have the rule, the way that you score objectives is that you just count up the amount of objective control points that are on the marker, and the player that has the most wins. If neither player has more, then neither player gets the objective. Objective control zero units won't be able to control a point at all, say if they're succumbing to battle shock. Though in general the system seems pretty simple and intuitive, usually things like battle line troops tend to get more objective control. Other than that, there is one actually fairly major change in 10th edition, and that's that you can't actually end a move directly on top of an objective marker as you can now. This might be partly to try and see where the objective marker is, or perhaps stop certain manoeuvres like parking a ridiculously enormous unit on the objective so the opponent can't get close, but in reality that is going to be quite annoying for certain things with big profiles like say tanks or knights. Big super heavy vehicles might find an objective marker, something that genuinely gets in their way now, basically a pillar in which they can't finish their move, and if they can't quite clear it because they don't have enough movement, it might mean that they have to move slower if there's terrain either side. That might be a slight weird one whenever it comes up, but I suppose being able to see the objective marker will be handy most of the time. Finally, within the core rules, we do also get an example mission called Only War. This one's aimed to be a simple starter mission, some basic objective scoring, and you also win if you table the opponent. More complex missions are going to be found in the Crusade packs, or in that chapter approved battle deck type thing that's coming in the Leviathan box. There is a core set of mission rules, but it's almost a bit worthless really. It basically just defers a lot of things to say that the mission will tell you how to do this, including for fairly basic things like who gets first turn. For this mission, the objective rules are that players alternate placing objective markers somewhere that's greater than 6 inches from battlefield edges and 9 inches from other markers, and then you basically get one victory point if you hold an objective at the end of your command base, so this would be after your battle shock. The player whose turn it is scores one victory point for each objective that they hold at this point, to a maximum of three victory points per turn. Kind of implies that in other missions, they're also going to be scored at this point. Then, after setting up the objectives, you roll for attacker and defender. The deployment zones are marked on the mission map here. Looks like this is one that uses the short board edges, and then there's 24 inches to separate the two armies beyond that. Then, once you've determined the attacker and defender, you declare battle formations, put the leaders in bodyguard squads if you want to, put units in reserve if you'd like to, declare which units are going to be starting in transports, and whether flyers are going to be hovering or coming in turn 2 and zooming around. Technically, the way to do it is apparently keep them secret and then reveal them at the same time so neither player gets an information advantage, though in practice I suspect most people will just tell their opponent, as a lot of the time it's not going to be the biggest deal. Then you deploy armies, alternating units as in 9th edition. You start with the attacker dropping the first one. This does seem like basically a pure negative now, as neither army gets to pick their deployment zone, it's all preset. 
Then after you've alternated units and deployed all your normal ones, you then deploy things like infiltrators, you roll off against your opponents to see which one deploys first, and then they go down potentially in the mid board if you want to put them there. Then you get to roll for first turn, now the player seems to get an advantage in this, and the winner of the roll off takes first turn, you don't have the option to choose to go second these days. The player who goes first gets to move all of their scout units before the second player, could be pretty handy for taking up positions in the mid board if both of your armies have them. As per the rest of the core rules, you then play through 5 battle rounds, trying to take those objectives and kill the opponent's army. Perhaps in a bit of a shake up to most other missions in 40k and 9th edition, it looks like in this mission at least, tabling the opponent and wiping out all their models, this wins the game. Not sure whether that will translate over to the other match play missions and things, currently tabling doesn't guarantee you a win if the opponent has won hard on objectives up to then. Otherwise beyond that though, the winner is the player with the most victory points from standing on those objectives and trying to take their opponents. Overall seems a decent enough and pretty simple starter mission. I do quite like the simple way that the objectives are scored rather than messing around too much with secondaries or more high minded things. Perhaps the only major criticism I might have of it is that the objectives are really incentivized to be put far back in your own deployment zone. I feel like it's a bit more interesting when you have some points in the mid boards to put them on and you have both armies scrapping over central objectives as opposed to trying just to kill the opponent army and then hopefully roll over them to their home field objectives. In any case, hope you've enjoyed a bit of a breakdown of 40k 10th edition from the core rules. Pretty cool to see how the game's going to play pretty much in full. I'll certainly look forward to reviewing the other game modes when we get more details. Things like Combat Patrol, Crusade and the Mission Deck will all be interesting to see how they work. Overall, it's going to be a fun edition, I think. I think a lot of the core rules have been realised pretty sensibly. It's not really too much that I might have done differently. I maybe just feel a bit ambivalent about the removal of the psychic phase there. I feel like that was a fairly nicely executed mechanic and minigame. Otherwise though, it feels simple, punchy and effective. Pretty much an update on 9th edition's rules with a bit more polish. Definitely looking forward to playing some games. Let me know your thoughts anyway, and if you enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and that's what allows me to make quite so many videos like this, particularly great big hour long summaries of rule books do take a fair while. If you have been finding the videos useful, any support is enormously appreciated, and the link to the Patreon is down in the video description. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.